Good morning, Crossroad. It's great to see everybody. It's great to have you guys. If you're watching online, great to have you guys with us. We are so excited, and I'm going to address the elephant in the room right now. Choir's back. So we're going to have a revival this morning. Let's do this, all right?
speak to Father, and you, you've meant to send them, you make them whole, as only you can do, Lord. God, we place all of these things in your hands. We lay them at your feet. Thank you for the cross and what you've done that takes these things and makes them whole. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, good morning, church. We are so glad, whether you're joining us online or in person, man, we are just excited to see you today. And man, how about that choir coming back? Am I right? Man, it has been a long wait, and we are just excited to have them back. You can feel that energy. You can see their passion for God. Man, it's cool. So I'm excited. I hope you guys are too. Uh, if this is your first Sunday, you picked a good one to come back uh, or to come at all. So um, if it is your first Sunday, we would love to welcome you. We'd love to answer some questions. We'd love to connect with you, hear your story. And so you can see information on how to do that in the comments online or in the row in front of you. Um, additionally, you can also see uh, a way to get prayer. We would love to join you in prayer, whether you've been coming for a long time or you are new. Um, you know, prayer is a really important part of uh, our faith journey and our relationship with God. And so we love and we've got folks that are passionate about prayer and they would love to join you in whatever is going on in your life. So don't hesitate. We've literally got people like waiting, waiting, watching. You can text in a prayer, guys. It's super cool. So we would love for you to do that if that's something that would be helpful to you in this season. Um, and so the last thing I've got today is super fast, just a gentle, quick, excited reminder. We do have trunk or treat tonight. Woo! -hoo! I have to, I should step away from this microphone when I cheer. I'm very loud. Uh, so that is tonight from four to six. It is not too late to pop by. It's not too late to, more importantly, invite somebody that you know. Um, there are lots of folks in our lives, and whether they have kids or not, this is a fun family cool event to come to, to hang out. There's going to be games. There's a ton of trunks. Um, thanks to you guys who all signed up. It's very exciting. And so, um, again, 4 to 6 p.m., free candy, free games, um, and then there'll be like some popcorn and stuff that you can buy if you're looking to do that. But it's going to be a great time. We'd love to see you guys out tonight. Uh, and then Kevin, Pastor Kevin, will be taking it from here. All right. Thanks so much, Alex. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So good to see all of you here, those of you with us in person. I want to say a special welcome to all of you who are streaming with us uh, online. Thank you so much for uh, being with us Today we're in part three of a series that we started uh, this month called Abide, where we have been learning from an invitation Jesus gives his disciples when they gather for the Last Supper. So this is just hours before Jesus goes on to be crucified. He knows this. The disciples really have no idea at this point. But these are some of Jesus' parting kind of final words. You could think of it in some ways as kind of his final sermon before uh, crucifixion. It's recorded in John 15. So let's hear again this powerful invitation from Jesus to all of us. Let's bring it up on the screen, and I'll read it for us. Here's what the text says. I am the true vine. So this is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Time out. So Bible scholars have helped, helped us understand more about this verse. So we're jumping in at John 15. If you turn back a couple pages in your Bible to like John 13, thereabouts, is you might remember in the Last Supper, there's this powerful scene that's recorded in John's account of that night where when they walk in, Jesus uh, performs the role of a servant. Do you remember where Jesus washes his disciples' feet, makes them clean? So this verse is Jesus pointing back to that action of him uh, uh, cleansing, purifying, richly purifying uh, the disciples. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Let's say the last sentence out loud. Go. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing so in this passage from john oh did i stop too soon do we have one more slide coming oh forgive me if you do not remain in me you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish 
and it will be done for you. So Jesus invites us to remain in him. This is where we get the name of our series, Abide. In, our, in older translations of the Bible, it just uses that verb, abide. Jesus invites you and me to abide in him, and he will abide in us. So in the first week of our series, I'm just going to catch us up real quick if you're just jumping in today. We explored the fact that Jesus uses plural language in his invitation. I lived for 15 years in my wife's home state of Kentucky. Easiest way for me to explain this to you is with the word y'all. Everyone say (laughs) y'all. Jesus is saying y'all abide in me and I will abide in y'all. We do this together and not alone. Do we follow Jesus alone? Of course we do. But that's just scratching the surface of what God wants to do in our lives. That, by the way, is why this feels so good right now us worshiping together and one more time can we give a shout out to our choir and music and band and and production team and worship team and all of them this morning but the choir is never limited to folks who are up here on the stage you didn't realize this but when you walked into this worship service when you tuned it in online you were deputized immediately and instantly became of God's choir crossroads choir this morning because we're all a part of this together and one of the reasons this feels so good to do this is because we are following Jesus's instructions we are abiding y'all together all of us I would imagine in a crowd this size, plus all of us watching online, that there's quite a number of differences in the room right now, in perspective, in background, in outlook. We might even have some differences in opinion with with one another. I mean, the list could go on. There's something so powerful, though, when we choose to lay that aside and to find our common ground in who? In Jesus Christ. Because the ground is level at the foot of the cross where we all come together as imperfect followers and disciples. So there's power in this of abiding together. And then last week, we talked about, we dove into uh, uh, how important it is uh, to have intentionality behind abiding. That that abiding in Jesus, in other words, it doesn't happen on accident. That Jesus is very clear in his invitation is that we have to cooperate and participate with God's grace. Uh, One of my favorite words for that is to respond. You and I have to use the free will that God's given us to choose to respond to God's gift of grace. And so we have to abide on purpose. All right, so now we're caught up. And this week, we're going to look at what is easily the most difficult part of Jesus' invitation. This is the part that I really wish Jesus had left out. I really wish this part was not in in my Bible because it makes me uncomfortable inside. I really like the idea of abiding in Christ. I know that you do too. I love the idea of us remaining in Jesus. It sounds so lovely. It just sounds so wonderful. If I remain in Jesus, then my life is like a tree that bears fruit. What a promise. But friends, this promise comes with pain. Yeah, you heard me right. (laughs) Jesus, this wonderful promise, it comes with some pain. So buckle up, here we go. We heard this already. Here it is again, verse one, two, three. He says, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. Let me bring it up on the screen, there it is. But look at this next part. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he, what's the next word in the text? Prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. So Jesus describes two different kinds of branches. We'll take them one at a time. First, he describes fruitless branches, branches that are not bearing fruit. Maybe they used to at some point, but they do no longer. And he says that these branches are going to be removed from the vine by the gardener. We talked about last week how this metaphor Jesus is using about great vineyards, the people he was talking to in the first century, they all would have spent time, some of them quite a bit of time, walking with their bare feet through the soil of actual great vineyards. All Jesus has to do is just invoke the image of, of, of a gardener tending grapevines. And everyone he's talking to in, in that setting would have known instantly what this is like. We have to do a little bit of extra work because, because most of us are not very agricultural people. Most, I know some of us have, but most of us in the room have not grown up around farms or especially around, around grapevines every day. So there's a real practical reason a gardener removes a non-producing branch from a vine. Here's what I learned from a friend of mine. Because the only way to get that branch to start bearing fruit is to start over. To start over at the source where it connects to the vine. Because that branch is either a dead branch or a diseased branch or it's on the way to becoming one. And the gardener doesn't have anything against that branch. What does the gardener want? He wants the vine to grow. 
He wants it to be healthy, but there's actually more to this too. You're going to love this part. Gardeners these days have a word for that first kind of branch Jesus is describing. You know what that word is? Suckers. Not kidding. (laughs) They actually refer to them as suckers because if these branches are not removed, if they're allowed to worsen and get out of control, they eventually apparently can start to suck the life from other branches and even potentially can do harm to the vine itself if it's not dealt with. And so the gardener clips the branch all the way back to the source so that it can grow, so that it can regrow from that point and then eventually bear fruit. That's always what the gardener has in mind. Sometimes we need a fresh start. Sometimes we need, we need a do-over. We have to be able to hit the reset button in our spirituality, uh, sometimes in, in our, our relational kind of engagements and experiences uh, with other people. Sometimes uh, we, we have to, uh, uh, another reword would be uh, seek reconciliation or restoration after some sort of deadness um, has kind of set in. When that's possible, when to do so wouldn't harm ourselves or other people. Sometimes we have to hit the reset button and need a complete do over. And Jesus is saying to us that in God's vineyard, we have a master gardener who specializes in restarts. Thanks be to God that he specializes in rebirths. In fact, earlier in this same gospel we're studying in this series, in John's gospel, Jesus has an encounter with a very smart guy named Nicodemus. And, and, but Jesus looks at him in the branch of Nicodemus' life and the best way Jesus can describe it to Nicodemus and to us is to say, Nicodemus, you're going to have to be born all over all again. <laughs> We're gonna have to completely restart and redo and rebirth some things here so that you can experience all the goodness of the kingdom of heaven in your life. Sometimes our connection to the vine, it gets so distant, so dormant that the gardener who loves us takes us all the way back to the joy of our first salvation. Why? So that he can begin a new good work in us, through us, that's going to be carried on to its day of completion in Christ Jesus. Second kind of branch, though, that Jesus describes. So we've covered the first kind, but he talks about a second kind. Here's what he said in verse 2. He said, every branch that does bear fruit, the gardener prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. All right, are you, are you with me so far? Which branches are going to get pruned? Which ones? You are awake. You are paying attention. Yeah. Every branch, every branch that bears fruit, Jesus says, is going to be pruned. I mean, let that sink in for a moment. Every branch. To be connected to the vine means pruning no exceptions, right? I mean, there's some branches that have to go all the way back to the beginning and restart, but then you have these branches that are doing fine. Look at me, I'm bearing some fruit. Jesus says, great, here comes the pruning. (laughs) Every branch, every branch to, to live as a follower of Jesus, it involves this process that Jesus compares to a vine being pruned. Okay, the pruning is not punishment. Let me say that again. The pruning is not punishment. It's not a punitive measure here. No, the gardener has a purpose. You could also use the word plan. The gardener has a plan, a master plan. What the gardener wants is what? Even more fruit, <laughs> more health, more life, more the, the, all of the taste and the flavor and, and the bright, vibrant color. The gardener wants even more fruit. He wants to help every branch uh, achieve an even greater level of, 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 of uh, I don't even want to use the word productive, uh, uh, even more fruitfulness, even more life, even more vibrancy, that this is the master plan and purpose of the gardener. The pruning is not punishment. It's not punitive. It's not karma. The pruning is not the universe trying to settle a score with you because of what you did last Tuesday. No, the pruning is intended to make us even more fruitful, even more fruitful. The way Jesus sees it, God has a purpose and a plan behind this process of pruning back all the branches that are connected to the vine. All right, we're going to go deeper. Are you still with me so far? 
Don't tune out yet. You're going to let you're going to miss so much good stuff. We're going to go a little bit deeper here. All right, stay with me, please. John's gospel is written in an ancient form of the Greek language. The word that shows up in our Bibles is pruned. It's actually the Greek word katharos. Everyone say katharos so I know you're awake. Katharos. Here you see on the screen, if, if you took that Greek word katharos, here would be the most direct way to take it into modern English. Clean, pure, unstained. When you see pruned, it's this word katharos. It's what you see on the screen right now. Every branch, you could even sub it out. Every branch in, in some sort of way would be cleansed, cleaned, purified, pruned. It's where we get the English word catharsis. Maybe you've heard of a cathartic event before it describes the experience of being cleansed and healed by something that empties us of, of pain or a burden that we might be carrying, physical, emotional, spiritual, a burden that we might be carrying within us. That's a cathartic moment or experience. By the way, a cathartic experience often involves some pain, doesn't it? People sometimes when they refer to a catharsis in their life, they might refer to that time that they broke down just just sobbing, just racked with tears and with pain, almost like a violent explosion of, of, of painful, whether it's, it's a sadness or a lament or a grief or a brokenness or an anger, whatever it might be, this is a catharsis within us. But on the other side of it, here's the key, is it leaves us feeling healed, it leaves us feeling cleansed, made whole. Jesus says every branch that does bear fruit is catharos, is pruned, made clean so that it will be even more fruitful because there's even more that the gardener wants for us. There's even more that the gardener has for us. So how's this catharos take place? I mean, Jesus told us in verse three that it's connected to the very word, the very teachings of Jesus himself. These words of life that our master gave to his disciples and to us in our Bibles to show us a new way to live and to be. It says that this, this process, this, this pruning, this, this shaping, this reshaping, it's, it's when we allow ourselves to be subjected to this Jesus reorientation of the way that we live and move and have our being. And it's, it's, it's us refusing to cave or capitulate to the violence and the power and the evil systems of this world and instead placing ourselves and this sounds crazy in, to the world. It sounds foolish to the world. Placing ourselves under the authority of the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. Abiding in Jesus, abiding in Jesus, it's being transformed, allowing ourselves to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, this rebirth. Remember what I mentioned about Nicodemus? This rebirth of us into a new life as new creations in Christ. All of this is catharos. Doesn't this sound good so far? Okay, I'm worried about the right side of the room over there. None of them are still with me. I'm sorry. I know we did Greek for a minute, but we're back. We're back. You can come back. Nudge the person next to you. Wake him up. This is catharos. This is pruning. This is being made more whole, more complete, more fruitful, more grounded. The whole thing is rigged. The whole thing is rigged for your growth. This whole way of following Jesus, of coming to him imperfect with all of our sins and imperfection, selfishness, shame, pride, all of it. The whole deal when we say yes to Jesus' offer of new and unending life, the whole thing from that point forward, it's rigged for your growth <laughs> and maturity and wholeness. Remember Jesus says, what does it all come down to? It comes down to loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as even as we ourselves are loved. That, that all of it is, that once we say yes to Jesus' offer, as he launches us forward on this new path of transformation, of catharos, of pruning, the whole thing is set up for, so for the Holy Spirit to pull you and I forward, step by step, day after day, into becoming people who are more and more like Jesus in the way we talk, the way we act, our attitudes, even our, our thought life gets reprogrammed and reorient. John Wesley called this being saved to the uttermost essence of who we are. The whole thing is rigged for your growth and for mine. Oh, you're going to love this too. Notice that uh, where he puts the pruning, where Jesus places the pruning in John 15. 
this series, we kind of went out of order on purpose. I didn't want to start with pruning in week one because I knew the visitors wouldn't come back. So we started with, with the stuff that I like a lot in week one and two. But because I have to be faithful to the text and Jesus' teaching, we have to get into the pruning today. But notice where Jesus places it first. Those verses were verses one, two, three. Before Jesus ever says, abide in me and I'll abide in you, you know what Jesus wants to talk about first with us? You're going to get pruned. <laughs> You're going to get pruned. It's, it's unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, I mean, and talk about the worst sales pitch ever to invite people to be followers of Jesus. He leads with the pain. He starts with the pain and with the discomfort. That's how he sets up this promise of abiding in him and he abides in us. But say with me, when you think about it, it really does start to make sense. He starts with the pain because a journey to health and wellness, it always starts with some pain and some discomfort. Have you ever uh, started a running program or a walking program before after like weeks or months of not doing that at all? What do those first two or three days feel like in your shins? You're with me now, right? Right? And the, the feet just ache. They just hurt. It starts with the pain. So then what do we have to do? We have to push through. We have to push through. Let me try another one. Let me try another one. So we know this with physical health. What about, uh, have you ever tried to, to start or increase a habit of prayer, of meditation, of contemplation, potentially even something that caused you to have to reorient your schedule, to set an alarm clock 30 minutes earlier, or to set aside some quiet time, not for Netflix, but for getting alone with God? What are those first couple days or weeks like as you try to, to grow that habit of, of prayer? You get distracted by every squirrel, don't you? <laughs> Has it been, oh no, it's been 30 seconds. Oh, it feels like half an hour already. I gotta get to this. You, like you're, you're writing in your prayer journal and before you know it, you're making a list for Costco. You're like, what am I doing? I'm so sad. Because it, it, there's discomfort. There, okay, let me try another one. You, you know, uh, if something within you, maybe someone you love, someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth, whatever opens up the door, the possibility that, hey, someone did, gave this gift to me um, many years ago. Kevin, I think you need to go see a counselor, a licensed professional uh, counselor or therapist to deal with some things, to unpack some things that you've been carrying around within you. You know, for me, what the heart, which visit was hardest? The first visit. <laughs> the first visit to a therapist or a counselor, it's always the hardest it starts with pain. It starts with, let me try another one. For anyone you love who's ever had to try to seek uh, being clean and, and sober from drugs or alcohol or something else, you know which recovery meeting is the hardest one to attend? The first one. It's embarrassing. It, it, it involves a lot of vulnerability. What in the world am I getting myself into? With all these people, I'm fine, but all these people who have all their crazy problems, all these things that will go through, whatever. See, Jesus, it, he starts with the pain with this promise that's coming. And so with that in mind, this whole process of pruning, you know where it's going to start with? With trust. And that's where we are in, in week three in our series. So we've already learned we have to abide together, we have to abide on purpose, and we can go to the next slide. Today, one thing I want you to take home with you this week is we have to abide with trust. Abide with trust. Would you say that sentence out loud with me? Go. Abide with trust. Abide with trust. Jesus starts with the pain of the pruning and the promise comes right on its heels. We're going to have to take him at his word. We're, at the end of the day, we're going to have to trust him. We're going to have to trust Jesus when the pruning is uncomfortable, when it feels awkward or painful or all of those things. We're going to have to trust him. We're going to have to trust him that he really does want to abide in us to remain in us, that he really does have even more life for us. See, when we abide in Jesus with trust, here's something that happens, is we're finally able to start dropping the burden of being successful in other people's eyes. We don't have to prove ourselves anymore. We don't have to prove ourselves to colleagues. We don't have to prove ourselves to maybe voices from our past or from our childhood. We don't have to prove ourselves to our own impossible standards, to our own inner critic. We don't have to prove any of that. We don't have to accomplish. We don't have to achieve. We can simply, joyfully abide and just be a beloved son or daughter of God. 
Just abide in Jesus. Allow him to abide in us. The gardener wants to help us there. The gardener wants to help us get into that freedom. And that's why he lovingly needs to strip away our need for success, achievement, accomplishment, approval, whatever it might be. This pruning, it's not one and done. You can see this is an ongoing stripping away of things that that need to get taken off the branch so that we can add even more fruit. N.T. Wright, look at the way he says it. He says, they've had to submit to the pruner's knife. He's talking about the kind of branch that has already started to bear some fruit. They've had to submit, cutting away other goals and ambitions. They've already borne fruit. They must now expect more pruning. Why? So that they can bear more fruit. It's ongoing. Wesley called it a, a sanctifying grace. It's this grace that sanctifies us or cleanses us, prunes us, shapes us day by day, moment by moment, choice by choice. You know, I think a lot of our spirituality, a lot of our following Jesus, I think a lot of it is determined and driven by those little mundane choices, those zillion choices that you and I make every week and how we do or don't use our words and and how we do or don't choose to engage or interact with a hurting person around us. I think it's in those zillion little choices, choice after choice, Uh, singer-songwriter Rich Mullins, in one of his most famous songs, he wrote it this way. He said, and step by step, you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Pruning requires trust, abiding with trust, step by step, all of our days. All right, so how can we take this home this week? I want to leave you with a few ideas, a few practical suggestions from the Bible to to help us lean into the pruning, even though it can be painful. Here's number one. Pruning requires trust in God's time. Trust in God's time. We live in this hurry-up world. Pandemic, COVID has just magnified and sped up a process that had already kicked in. Here's what I mean. We expect everything delivered to our doorstep, not in two days anymore, but in one day. (laughs) I mean, some of us are already, where are those drones already to like just drop it? on the doorstep. If you don't have enough time to cook dinner, don't worry, Uber Eats to the rescue. Is 4G too slow? Don't worry, 5G, right around the corner. Apparently it's gonna be 10 times faster. But you know what doesn't have anything to do with speed? Gardening. Gardening takes time. We measure the growth of vineyards not in seconds, but in seasons. So this culture we live in that's so frantic about the future, (laughs) that's so terrorized by all these timelines, the words of Jesus come crashing in like a healing balm, inviting us to abide in the present moment, to surrender all these outcomes, these timelines, to surrender all of that to God. Here's one example. There's many I could choose from. Matthew 6. Jesus says to us, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he, God, the gardener, will give you everything you need. Listen to verse 34. So don't worry about tomorrow. That might be the only reason God brought you to church today. is to hear Jesus say to you, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Can I get an amen and a witness? <laughs> to that. Trust, trust in God's time. So this means we don't need to criticize ourselves anymore, that we're not farther along than we wish we were. Could you please stop doing that? Please hear it from your pastor today. Stop playing that game. I should be farther along on this journey and in my discipleship and my Christianity. Stop doing that. that, that I should be farther along than I am We don't need to compare our journey to anyone else. You know, branches on a vine, they don't worry about the fruit that's over on the next branch. (laughs) They just enjoy being able to soak up all that sunlight and just grow. To trust that the gardener has that branch's best interests at heart. Master gardeners, they know exactly how much pruning a branch can tolerate and when can abide with trust. So it's trust in God's time. Here's number two. Pruning requires trust in God's plan. Would you say trust in God's plan? Go. Trust in God's 
plan from the branch's perspective. Pruning probably doesn't always make much sense. I mean, I'm thinking if I'm a branch, and I am, Mr. Gardener, why mess with a good thing? I got some fruit over here. You know, the sun's out and got some rain and, you know, no pests really to worry about today. Disease is kind of held at bay. Like, Mr. Gardener, can't we just kind of leave well enough alone? But the gardener knows this, that left to its own devices, eventually a healthy branch will do what? It'll get tangled up. There will be all kinds of overgrowth. It'll get out of control. Eventually, that will lead to even a healthy branch becoming a dead, fruitless branch. The ongoing process of pruning keeps the branch thriving and keeps it alive. In other words, you and I are always capable of more growth, more life, more joy. There's always an even greater depth of forgiveness of our ability to show and receive mercy. There, there's always more wisdom, more maturity. The master gardener sees this in you and in me. I mean, he created us, after all. He, he always has an eye on the best version of you and me and always is wanting to help us take the next step. This is the plan. When I say trust in God's plan, it's all of these things. God sees all of the possibilities. God has the power to make all of these possibilities realities. This plan that God has for you and for me to move heaven into your heart right here, right now. This is why Jesus taught us to pray this way. Again, Matthew 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Read the next part out loud. Go. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is a prayer for the whole earth and it's a prayer for your life and for mine. And I think we should pray it both ways. God, let your will be done on earth and let your will be done on me. Let heaven come to earth starting right here at Crossroad Church. <laughs> Amen. God's will on earth, it's accomplished one life at a time, one branch at a time. So are you trusting in God's plan for your life? Or do you find yourself today trying to white knuckle some outcomes, trying to control and manipulate some outcomes that just need to be released today? That God's inviting you just to abide with trust, trust in God's timing and trust in God's plan. But here's the last one. Look with me at see on the screen we'll bring it up pruning requires this trust in god's love trust in god's love say that out loud go trust in god's love on the other side of the pruning there is a loving and tenderer loving and tender and wise master gardener that wants to see us bear even more fruit so i was surprised to learn that the greek word for gardener in John 15, some of your Bibles will say farmer, farmer, gardener. You know what it actually means? Vine dresser, <laughs> vine dresser. Is Tori Hart in the house? I saw her today. Hair, uh, hairstylist, hairdresser, and business owner. And there might be more too besides Tori. Tori's just the only one I know right off the top of my head. So, but I love that, Tori. The, this idea of a gardener tending the grapevines, it's a vine dresser <laughs> because that indicates almost an art and a, and a beauty and a creativity to it. And I think, oh, that's so appropriate. See, I didn't always understand Jesus' metaphor this way, as a vine dresser, going to work in almost an artistic kind of way, in a masterful uh, way. Melissa, too, you, you're a hair, hairdresser as well. I'm sorry, I, I overlooked you. So we got more, too. Yeah, so Melissa, here's what I've always thought when I've thought of, like, the, yeah, <laughs> free haircuts after church. Um, the, w when I've read John 15, I think of this. <laughs> these are my hedge clippers and I, I don't take care of them it's hard to see from the back and I know you can't see it at all on camera they're very rusty and nasty and so uh, we pr I probably need to get a tetanus booster just doing this sermon illustration just by osmosis but they're very rusty and awful and I, I know you're not supposed to hate them uh, mom you taught me not to hate I hate these things <laughs> I hate these things with a passion because whenever I look at them and see them in my garage uh, instantly in my mind, I think a million degrees, getting stung by wasps, sweating through my clothes as I blindly, ha I'm going to, Wade's nervous, I'm going to chop his microphone off, the, the, as I blindly hat this way and that, it shrubs and hedges that I let get out of control in, in my backyard, and I'm just trying not to get nailed by the HOA again, you guys know how it goes, pray for your pastor, and just trying to cut these things, 
cut these, yeah, we're going to have a healing service right after this. Yeah, about HOAs. Going after the hedges and the shrubs, these clippers. Found these online. The special order. These uh, are uh, bonsai. Do you know bonsai trees, plants? These are specially designed as bonsai pruning uh, scissors. Uh, they're, they're designed to, to give the user almost a surgical precision to be able to tend to a bonsai tree, to do pruning, to make it look beautiful, to make it perfect. This is, I think, a lot closer as a modern day example. Not this. Let's not think about this when we hear pruning. <laughs> this is a lot closer, I think, to what Jesus is getting after in John 15. Listen to words that he said. So when Jesus is talking to his disciples about pruning, they're hearing echoes of what he just said to them one page earlier in our Bibles. John 14. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also and may we can trust the vine dresser. He knows what he's doing. He knows why he's doing it. I'll show you an image I found online. What you're looking at right now is uh, this man apparently is considered to be one of the greatest living masters of the ancient art of uh, tending bonsai trees. Prunums, an elderly Japanese Man, this is actually a screen grab I, I got from a YouTube video, a tutorial, that you got to go into his workshop, and he kind of walked you through this process that's been handed down through his family over generations, and he has spent several decades of his own life mastering this art. He talked about how important it is to, to make the most minute, precise adjustments, trims that you possibly can to each branch the bonsai plant, the one you're seeing right there, he spends hours, all day in fact, making this, this bonsai tree, this plant, every leaf, every branch, exactly how it needs to be. This is how God transforms you and me into people who are becoming more and more like Jesus with care, with precision, with mastery, and especially with love. Love. So not too long ago, I was uh, sat down with someone who's become a dear friend of mine. Uh, we're had, supposed to have a meeting together and a conversation. And uh, the conversation wasn't very comfortable for me. This is a person who's close enough with me that uh, when I, it's the kind of person, the kind of friend that when I ask for uh, feedback, they love me enough to uh, respond with honest feedback. And so I'd ask for this, but see, I'm not a good Christian person like you guys. Sometimes I ask for something, but I don't really want it. <laughs> and so I'd ask for this person to be truthful, but I didn't really want to hear what they had to say. But to my friend's credit, they shared with me the truth and love and with a lot of gentleness. But gosh, it was not easy for me. Inside, as I reflect back, I was like, why was that hard for me? There was this churn that started kind of somewhere in here, even kind of just like the whole torso. <laughs> it was this churn inside me of these unpleasant feelings and emotions. It was a mix of, um, if I had to kind of put it into words, I'd say maybe some anger, definitely a lot of anxiety kind of raging uh, inside me because my pride and my ego were wounded. And so for several hours I carried with me after that conversation, this churn inside of me until I sat down and reread these words. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I realized in that moment of freedom and healing that came from God's word is that my friend had no idea. But in that moment, the Holy Spirit transformed them into a gardener <laughs> as an agent of the gardener because the gardener needed to do some pruning in me to help me be a better disciple, to help me be a more loving 
follower of Jesus, a more present Christ follower, which in turn, of course, I realized that, oh, this is the process of pruning that actually helps me be a better parent to my kids this week. Helps me be a better husband to Ashley, a better son, a better friend. Helps me be a better pastor to you here at Crossroad. It helps me to be a branch connected to the vine that can bear even more fruit. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are invited by Jesus today and every day to abide with trust, even in those moments of churn, even in those moments of, of the pain that comes along with that, that wound to our pride when the pruning starts to happen. But, but we can trust the gardener because he, he always wants for us more life, more joy, more compassion, more kindness, more gentleness, more forgiveness, more holiness. He wants all of that and so much more for you and me. That's how much the gardener loves us. So what does the gardener need to prune from your branch this week so that you can become healthier, so that you can become even more fruitful for God's kingdom? Would you stand and pray with me? God, we give you thanks today for the gift of this, this powerful image of a vine dresser at work in the master's vineyard. And so, Holy Spirit, would you help us to trust you completely? That for those of us here today that have borne fruit for you, have felt our lives being shaped and changed for the better by you. We hear you say to us today, Jesus, that, that there's some pruning that you always want to do in our lives to help us grow. So teach us to trust you as the gardener goes to work on us. So for some of us, that means we need to learn to trust in your timing this week. For others, it'll mean learning to surrender some outcomes so that we can trust in your plan. And for some of us today, it might mean going all the way back to the beginning and learning just to trust in your love. And maybe some of us today, we feel like that first group of branches that are just so disconnected from the vine, maybe never even connected to it at all. That We invite you today to start over, to give us a fresh start with you. Whatever it is, Lord, we're open to learning from you now. Speak to us in these tender moments of worship and prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a closing worship song together. If uh, you need prayer for any reason in your life, I'll be standing up here. Pastor George will be in the back. And you can do that now as we sing together or even after the worship service ends. Let's sing.
great to worship together today, and it continues this afternoon. So looking forward to celebrating out in our parking lot with a bunch of our neighbors at the Trunk or Treat and everything else, all the activities that are going to get going at uh, 4 o'clock. If you want to join a small group, we do have some forward groups getting ready to kick off. And so if you have questions about that or any other way to connect with our church, just go to the table with the balloons um, in the lobby and we'll help you out. And if you would like to give a gift uh, this week to support the work that God is doing through Crossroad Church, you can make a financial contribution anytime online at our website, which is crossroad.church. If you prefer to give your gift in person, we do have giving boxes that are by the exits. Now would you receive this blessing? My brothers and sisters in Christ, may you leave this place and abide with trust. The master gardener knows exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. Amen.